So um, Abigail Child has been at the forefront of experiment, experimental writing and media since the 1980s, having completed more than 50 film video works and installations and written six books. As a professor at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, Child um, has been instrumental in building an interdisciplinary media film program. Her most recent work is a trilogy of feature films, including Unbound, Unbound, an imaginary home movie of the life of Mary Shelley, teenage author of Frankenstein, and that just sounds so wonderfully interesting, uh, Acts and Intermissions on the life of, an, of anarchist Emma Goldman in America, and Origin of the Species, uh, that explores human machine interactions and gender roles in the 21st century. And I just wanted to say, um, you know, and I, I don't, this will sound hyper, hyperbolic and like hyperbole, but it's not meant to, uh, it's quite sincere. Um, I think Origin of the Species, which you should all watch on uh, Sydney Underground Film Festival and is available now, right? You can watch it on Sydney Underground Film Festival website. I think that's the best film on technology since Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera. So it's just fantastic. And I really recommend everyone go see it. It's very haunting. It's powerful. Just the use of montage uh, certainly rivals Vertov. So, so anyway, we're honored to have Abigail. And then I, I think I might introduce um, just before everyone's presentation. So uh, over to you, Abigail. Okay, um, I want to thank you, Alex, and uh, thank everybody who's there uh, listening to this. And thank you for that beautiful um, recommendation on my film. Vertov is, of course, one of my heroes, so that's immensely complimentary. Um, I was very interested in the keynote because they're talking about economic and politics. And, and although economic and politics enters into my work, my focus is really more on the body. And, and particularly robots that were the subject of my film or are the subject. So approaching the inhuman. When I ask myself, what is inhuman? My first thought is of human violence. And then again, I think, well, maybe violence itself could be considered intrinsically human. Living organisms are territorial and often combative, even at the microcellular level. What else have we been discussing with COVID these last two years? Territoriality and defense are our inheritance, our physical and bodily inheritance for survival. Even as the humanist, the ideational sense of ourselves, the moral sense of ourselves might say otherwise. Perhaps our fear of robots then is in part a reflection of how we see ourselves inhuman to other bodies, whether they be women or black, Jewish or Muslim, animal or even mineral, indifferent to difference, unseeing of difference, intolerant of difference. Difference itself is at the heart of the robotic project not just in terms of the representation of identity, the difference of color as with Bina 48, if you watch my film, who's the black lesbian narrator, robotic narrator of my film, Origin of the Species. Beyond identity, difference is inextricably tied to ethics. The psychic dissonance of difference, the uncanny of otherness, the psychological anxiety that propels us in the world, Robots don't have this sense of anxiety, this sense of suffering, ambivalence, uncertainty, or Heidegger's Dasen, the paradox of being thrown into the world. We might say then that a lack of anxiety is inhuman. Robots at this point are objects. We as humans invest anything that moves with intention with life, which is why some people name their Roombas and personalize them when they are merely machines. We invest even the still object with subjectivity. Think of children's dolls or stuffed toys. We cuddle them, we talk to them, they are sometimes our best friends, yet the objects don't give a damn about us. As robots look more and more human, they still remain machines. The attempt to create a replica of ourselves seems to me a human attempt to play God, to narcissistically create another self. Exactly what Mary Shelley critiques right away in Frankenstein. How do we take care of our creations? How do we take care of our children? Are we effective gods? or irresponsible ones. The issues of morality for objects are especially emphasized when these objects resemble us, whether dolls or robots, these mechanical beings that look like us. We bond with these objects or we bond with them perhaps more easily. 
And when they break, they reveal themselves as simply objects and our relations become revelatory. Do we put the broken toys in a closet when we're through with them? Do we throw them out? How do we negotiate or think about an ethics of objects in the particularly consumeristic society in which we live? In a society where we increasingly identify ourselves by our possessions, our house, our car, our clothes, our robot. The issue of the earth and our polluting of same, filling it with plastic, our cups, our brushes, our medicines, our fertilizers, our cleansing beads, broken down yet spread on sea and land is relevant. How is the ethics of objects or the ethics of objects is deeply entwined in our interrelation to earth itself? We might ask, is earth an object? But perhaps that's for another paper. <laughs> I, I don't want to get into the sort of theosophy of what earth might be for humans. Um, but what we're finding is a sameness itself reveals otherness. When we think of the robotic uncanny, we find the closer the android gets to look human, the more we are disturbed with feelings of uncomfortability or even fear. In Japan, I watched a little kid uh, hide when his mother in a booth was throwing her voice onto the robot in the Miracon exhibit. Um, and, and the kid knew something was wrong. Through sameness or closeness of resemblance, we experience and know difference. And I've often thought of this close difference in terms of world politics that sameness in physicality and locality can provoke conflict. I remember looking at a film years ago of Israel and thinking, my God, Palestinians and Jews look exactly alike. Think of the Irish Protestant and Catholic conflict, the Serbo-Croatian conflict, the conflicts in Sri Lanka, and the ever deadening conflicts in India today between Muslim and Hindi. The closer we get to each other, the more it seems we potentially defend and separate ourselves. And as I'm writing this, I was thinking even identical twins create uncomfortable and anxious feelings. I'm sure we've all experienced that. What is this doubling double? Double. Who are the duplicates? Which one is real? What or who is the simulacrum? What or who is in your mirror? Or online. One of the interesting things about the last speaker was she was out of sync for me. So her words were never matching her mouth. That, that strangeness of technology where it becomes, if not uncanny, at least very complicated. Okay, and if robots are becoming more human, we humans are becoming more synthetic, perhaps more robotic. I myself have a stapedectomy, a tino metal plate, replacing the horseshoe bone, the stapes in my right ear. I wear glasses. We're talking through the mechanical medium, you know, which in my childhood was defined as a TV phone, a video phone, and Zoom is the video phone of today, right? Physically, we're, and this she said as well, we're consorting, mating, eating with machines. My Korean graduate students in Boston would go online and eat with their family and friends in Korea with its 12 hour difference, one eating breakfast, the other dinner. Here, the contentment of virtual relation override their anxiety in being in existence in another country using another language. And look at us. I have right here my little phone. Um, you know, our recording device, our camera, our health tracker, our credit card. We're buying through the virtue. We're all Star Trek voyagers living on a fast track, accelerating into the future. And the materiality of flesh and distance at the same time is dissolving or even is dissolved. We are already, one could say, mutants. I mean, I'm certainly one, I'm, I'm a mixture here. And in our constraints, our agreement to the state, our accommodation to overriding culture, and as Lizzie talked about, our, our, accept, our acquiescence to data collection, um, as and Leotard points this out, we're already robots. Right. We've already entered the mechanical stream. Um, so these are some of the ideas going through my head when I first conceived Origin of the Species. As well, I shared some of Leotard's sense that we were creating something that could outlast our pollution of Earth. He speaks of leaving the planet, and it's even more prescient now, many a decade later, with the onslaught of climate change and the recent wealthy tech developers and civilians going for a ride above the Earth. Touristing space. Now NASA, then National Science 
lab of the United States has just announced plans to put a site on the moon and on Mars. It's clearly a, a conflict with China, like we want to, like Sputnik was a conflict with Russia. This is a way we're trying to over, you know, outdo them. So sci-fi imagination collides with the bureaucracy. Um, so I think humans need, perhaps unconsciously, maybe consciously, something that could last, something outside Earth, after our own tortured anxiety and need for conflict destroys our planet. This sense of escape only became stronger as I researched and filmed Origin of the Species, and my title references were creating a new creature for a new future. As well, I was, of course, struck with the gendered reality of robot development. Why are Siri and Alexa women at all? Never really been answered, but mo most mo much of my previous work investigates gender and desire. And this trilogy that ends with origin began at that node. Uh, I was reading the biography of Mary Shelley and realizing how ideology, the cult or idea, ideal of romanticism fails her, fails her for living, for family and for the body. Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin is a teenager when she takes off with Percy Shelley, the poet in 1814. He's a married man whose wife is pregnant with their second child. It would be a scandal today, and it certainly was a scandal 200 years ago. As a result, they were in exile from England for years. Her father wouldn't talk to her until she properly married. She has five children, of which four die, and her husband is promiscuous and rumored to be about to leave her when he dies in a shipwreck off the coast. As I was shooting this imaginary home movie, Unbound, of Mary Shelley in Italy, um, I realized I could find a similar example from the 20th and 21st centuries, wherein I could create a trilogy of feature films about gender, sexuality, and the politics of the respective eras. For the 20th century, I picked, as Alec has said, Emma Goldman and Anarchy, the ideology she lived by, and one that was an obstacle to her having a steady love or steady home life. Whether it was that she had to travel to speak or her multitudinous lectures, and they were, it was like she was on the road the whole time for years, or the fact that she experienced violence and jail for periods of time as well. The men in her life wanted a wife, a housewife, a mother, not a rabble rouser. They kept asking her to give up her politics, which was not possible. So it was the anarchistic beliefs, the ideology that dominated catapulting and overturning her body's desire. The result was a certain deflected unhappiness as well as a heroic statement of political belief. What I didn't realize when I first imagined that film was how the issues of immigrant rights, labor rights, and women's rights that Emma was fighting for were occurring a hundred years later in my time. In that the same issues from 1917 were duplicated in 2017. Right at the beginning for the 21st century, I saw that the dominant and most powerful ideology to explore would be science. We believe it will save us, repair us, will be medicine, wisdom, and teleport us off the planet. I wasn't sure that I wanted to choose a living woman to focus on. I thought it would have to be Jennifer Doudna, the discoverer of gene splicing, and I wasn't sure that would work. Originally, I explored the rock and roll hologram, the singing Japanese pop star, Hatsune Miku. I don't know if you've, any of you have watched it. She's kind of amazing. But it's a corporation that owns her, and it would be a study focused more on the response of Japanese people than a kind of global look at what robotics are doing. I'd experience autonomy automatons on the Jersey Shore where I grew up. You put in a quarter and Fatima would light up and deliver your fortune, a little paper dropped through the slot. But most appealing for me was perhaps the role robots have in our mythology and science fiction. Whether it's the medieval golem, Frankenstein's creature, the robot woman, Anna of Metropolis, Robbie the robot from TV, or even the 1870 ballet Coppelia, where the local boy falls in love with a d mechanical doll, so much so that his fiance has to act the doll in order to gain his attention. So, so much for metaphor. <laughs> it seems in these myths, our literature, art, there's always a depressive reading of machine creation, physical prowess, and the non-beating mechanical heart. 
There's a profound sense of mistake, danger, limits, the modern Prometheus indeed, which is Mary Shelley's subtitle. And is this intuition a product of culture, a projection of our inner fears, or perhaps the limits of the physical we're trying to outrun? And I think here of what's been recently discovered to happen to astronauts' bodies, their eyes and their mind when they spend time in weightlessness above Earth. Mark Kelly, the twin, uh, had cognitive deficits on his return. This has just been reported. I hadn't known of it previously, which have not gotten better. So we may all be from stars, that startling recognition that the universe itself is modeled on the same elements that are on Earth, an awesome recognition, I still think, and something I remember when I learned about redshift and how we learned about the universe as a teenager. But we have evolved on planet Earth, and we may want to fly to the stars, but we may be brought up short. We may want the robot to be completely human, but can it ever suffer, become full of uncertainty, vulnerability, and anxiety, become human? Is this progress an attempt to escape death, to translate our own death instincts into immortality, another kind of death? a sin against life, if you will, since all living things die. And uh, a last digression just about science and its, pot its potential failure, which maybe we don't want to look at when we're looking at a global failure. But I commuted to Boston for 16 years for my job at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. And it was a painful commute. It was a four hour commute and it was often delayed till five or six hours. I always wanted to be transported. Beam me up, Scotty. I don't know if that's a global phenomenon, but definitely. But to no avail. And I had remembered a sci-fi story that I'd read where commuting via transporting. But if they landed at the platform Platform, sort of like a subway platform at exactly the same time at exactly the same place they would explode and that was the traffic accidents of the future ghosting me in my dreams more humorously but similarly morbid was an ad on the back cover of wire magazine at the time was was promoting ads from the future and this one really got me it was for insurance for transporting if you came back with only one arm you got 20 percent of the policy if you came back with the limbs misplaced you got 30 percent of the policy and if you didn't come back at all, you got the 100%. It was clear to me that even if we found a way to separate our atoms and send them out into space, we would never be able to recompose them. In other words, the limits of, of science, which is maybe more than the limits of our imagination, okay? In fact, life itself is a recomposition, not unlike film editing or the ability to think on our feet, make of something, something new, something different. When Takashi Ikigami in my film speaks of when he, he says spontaneity is the key to the attribute of life, for me, his comment was the, the most aesthetic and profound response to robot science, that it's not artificial intelligence we're creating, but the hope is for artificial life. And so not merely algorithms, but a breathing spontaneity, that neither life nor human thinking happen as binary, but rather we live in context, have shades of feeling, words and thoughts, which means an element of the unknown is essential to the human, the sense of ambivalence and ultimately, yes, anxiety, the unknowable and suffering without which we would be inhuman. That's all for now. <laughs> Thank you so much. That, that was amazing, Abigail. Okay, so um, Katina Michael is a professor at Arizona State University, holding a joint appointment and the School of Future Innovations in Society and School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence. She's also the director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective, SPEC, and the founding editor-in-chief of the IEEE -E, Transactions on Technology and Society. Katina is a senior member of IEE -E, um, and a public interest technology advocate who studies the social implications of technology. Uh, we were very pleased uh, in a journal that I edit to publish 
um, an article of which she was one of the authors, uh, which was just amazing about um, surveillance in relation to Wim Wenders' wonderful uh, film, Wings of Desire. And I've known Katina for, for a few years now, but we've only ever corresponded. But even then, I, I, she's just one of her kindest, nicest, loveliest people uh, to meet. So we're very pleased to have you, Katina. What a joy uh, to be with you and to follow that amazing talk by Abigail Child. Abigail, I don't think I've ever been moved by someone's in-person talk. And I say in person over this wonderful medium of Zoom. I'm going to take a long time to process everything you've said, but I too believe in the spontaneity. And I don't know if we will be ever able to recreate that in our machines, but that's the difference between humans and machines. But what a talk. Um, Alex Wensborough, it's the first time I've seen you in face. Um, and the honor is to be on this eclectic panel uh, with you and through your invitation, through your amazing editorship and your support. Uh, I know MG Michael spoke, I think, at the second in human screens, or first even, I can't remember now. First, yes. <laughs> was the first time flies. Uh, but he was amazed by the presence at, in Marrickville, Sydney, from memory, uh, so many years ago. So before I begin, just briefly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, the Wadi Wadi people of the Darul land on which we meet virtually and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, thank you to the organizers of this amazing event. And today I'm going to take a very quick look at the role of artificial intelligence in higher education through the lens of speculative fiction. So the focus uh, is on a short story written by the wonderful Indian author Shiv Ramdas. It's titled The Trolley Solution. And Shiv was commissioned uh, by my ASU colleague Punya Mishra, who is an Associate Dean of Scholarship and Innovation at the Mary Lou Fulton School. Uh, it's a teacher's college at ASU. And Punya has worked extensively in the area of technology integration in teacher education and with collaborator MG Kohler discovered the TPAC framework, which stands for technological pedagogical content knowledge. And he's been cited thousands and tens of thousands of times on this TPAC framework. But he really is an amazing innovator. And Punya's hope was to stimulate discussion about the future of education in a post COVID world. So he approached Slate magazine. And together with Slate's editor in chief of Future Tense, Tori Bosch, now at New America, a US based think tank, Punya oversaw a three part series that looked at different facets of technology and education with respect to moral dilemmas. In essence, today I'm presenting one of those three short stories titled The Trolley Solution. And I should add, alongside the think tank, alongside uh, others, we also had the amazing presence of the Center for Science uh, and Imagination in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society. My research group was also involved uh, and mentioned today, the Society of Policy Engineering Collective. So you've got all of these people rallying behind the Shiv Ramda story. And of course, I jumped at the opportunity to respond to the story in critical commentary. And that piece was also published titled Just How Much of Higher Education Can Be Automated. So in summary, these were published in Future Tense Fiction, and it was a specialized series called Learning Futures, three science fiction short stories published as part of a collaboration between ASU, Slate, and New America. The series explores how learning experiences of all kinds will be shaped by technology and other forces in the future, and the moral, ethical, and social challenges this will entail. And here we are live discussing the story that Shiv Ramdas wrote, my response to his story, and of course, the very much the one that intervenes and the innovator there, Punya Mishra, in discussing various angles, both the authors and the respondents together. And what we did understand is that transdisciplinary approaches to the future of innovation can yield different and very much unexpected results. Speculative fiction, especially, is a powerful way to imagine future ethical dilemmas without being bound in present realities. 
So let's play a little bit of a clip here and see what Shiv has to say. Well, um, so one of the things I wanted to do when I was first contacted to do this story is along, along this theme of education and learning is I wanted to try and find something that I could set in a classroom because we're basically, we're, over the last year, we've sort of entered this era of sort of a transition in almost like pedagogical tools, essentially, because so much of virtual learning and long distance learning has been required because of this pandemic. And we've discovered a whole new set of problems and a whole new set of variables for teachers and everyone else to deal with. And it's not just teachers, students are having to deal with this stuff, parents are having to deal with this stuff. And it's all very new territory for everyone. So I just figured that setting something that was almost entirely played out in white space or in virtual space, so to speak, like almost all the, in fact, every interaction in this story happens remotely. Well, in a nutshell, science fiction basically pretends to explore the future, but what it actually does, it presents a vision of the present, right? And, mm -hmm. or a direction of the present. And that is what I wanted to do with the story while using white space and using the motif of the trolley problem, which thanks to pop culture has become the defining mm -hmm quote unquote, ethical dilemma of our times. So using these two different motifs, I wanted to sort of create a story that explored a possible future of the direction of education and the nature of learning. So the first thing I wrote to Shiv was, man, you're a prophet. I thought the future is here now. I thought, oh my goodness, he's talking about this institution and he must have heard the story about that institution and the failure of the bots in that one. I actually thought you had inside knowledge. So friends, this is happening now, not some future story. And we already have some shocking realities being played out. Oh, we invested 300,000 in this bot because we imagined that the computers and the learning management system could take care of itself without a single administrator or faculty member. And guess what? Surprise, surprise, the money has gone down the toilet. But what happens when science fiction becomes science fact? And we look at it from various angles, economics, the technical, the social, the legal, and all of the interplay and relations. It's scary. In fact, I didn't have to read Shiv's speculative fiction to know that what he was saying was happening right this moment. I had been privy to conversations that were talking about how we would optimize around this economics how we would replace teachers, humans with machines, how with the onset of COVID-19, the barriers that were put up, particularly in Australia, stemming the travel of international students who happened to be contributing at sometimes between 70 and 80% of revenue for postgraduate degrees. What would we do? The program still had to run. And how would we do that? Of course, there were many investments that were made in technology. One such conversation went as follows. Oh, you can create the course if you like. And then in the summer, we can just have it delivered. My question was by whom? The answer was, and I said, you know, in, in anticipation, by a tutor. No, 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 no. Oh, okay, by the learning management systems service officer. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I see. By an administrator. Oh, no, no. By who? By no one. Just run the module. And this is not a story that is um, rare in today's uh, society. Of course, we have Skinner's machine. And Skinner's machine was supposed to assist us uh, in 1954 with the ability to do various things. It could help students who were learning at different paces. It could enable teachers uh, to build the system and then it could be reproduced so that you didn't have to re reproduce the actual mentor. It would allow for people to wait for triggers and stimuli in order to respond, the SR response that would produce a consequence, then a reward, and then some conditioning. Of course, based on the early premise of behavioral economics. It was tailored and adaptive to learning systems. But Skinner really believed that it was such a waste of time to have teachers in the front of a classroom when you could actually have machines uh, teaching students. 
And here's another video of Skinner's machine, a prototype. These young people are studying in a new way. Class in spelling, it might as well be arithmetic or algebra or grammar, or in fact anything involving the use of words or symbols. Each student is using a teaching machine, a device which creates vastly improved conditions for effective study. What are teaching machines? How are they used? What can they teach? Who prepares the material they teach? And how does this material differ from textbooks, lectures, and educational television? What impact will machine teaching have on school organization? Some of these questions can be answered in at least a preliminary way. Friends, I don't know about you, but it, they sort of reminded me of slot machines. So the trolley solution begins with the trolley problem, and we can go back to 1967's article by Philippa Foote, The Problem of Abortion and the Doctrine of the Double Effect. And in this instance, the trolley problem is posed as a series of thought experiments in ethics and psychology invol involving stylized ethical dilemmas of whether to sacrifice one person to save a larger number. In Schiff's case of the trolley solution, what we have is the potential to sacrifice a whole department when one individual, the protagonist Ahmed, is set against the machine, Ali. And here we have this tug of and war happening. Ahmed is not only in it for himself and his tenure, but also for the rest of his school. And he is discussing the potential uh, impact with Niyati, his head of school, and the old man who runs the place, is referring also to Uma, and I won't spoil, spoil who or what Uma is in the end. But in actual fact, what we're seeing now with this panoply of conditions, a university opens without teachers, Chinese students will not go there, they're told by uh, Beijing education agents warning Australia, vice chancellors slashing more than 17,000 university jobs as of the 3rd of February, and this is not isolated just to Australia, the market continues to shrink. How a dead professor is teaching a university art history class because his reusable uh, sound bites and videos and presentations are still on offer, even though he's passed away. A student attempts to contact the dead professor and realizes his email is bouncing. And of course, then does some more digging to realize he had deceased the year before. One man, one computer, 10 million students, how Khan Academy is reinventing education. It's the gigifying of education, the uberization of education, and the McDonaldization of education. And where might that take us? What are the unintended consequences of AI in the classroom? Do we need less people, as has been posed to us, or more people? to assist us in better instructional design. I will always argue that this is not a bad move of going towards the best of both worlds where humans and machines are working in concert, but might we need better instructional designers to help us execute better curricula? But will it mean less human interaction instead of more? And what are the consequences of that less human interaction? For some students, it will possibly mean better literacy and for others maintaining illiteracy, even though they have access to more technology and more innovation than ever in the world. Also the impact on mentoring, you know, are wise people, the smartest people? Where is the place of wisdom in all of this? And what about future systems development flows? If we are conditioning our students to believe they do not require humans, then what kinds of systems will be produced by them in the future? So we need to strike a pivotal balance between technology and education and human workers. Learning should not be purely based on economics and optimizing. I think it should be based on human computer interaction with the benefit and the end result being better human to human interaction. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Katina. I mean, it's fitting that this panel is called, um, I think it's Digital Post Humanities. I wanted to, to cover the aesthetics, uh, but also the ethics and issues of, of the humanities and the post humanities in, in that. And you've done a wonderful job. Um, and uh, uh, Tonkin has been a practicing new media artist since uh, 1985. In 1999 to 2000, he received a fellowship from the Australia Council's New Media Arts Board. Uh, his broad interests have been around the creative possibilities of computation, particularly focused on interaction as a means of physical and conceptual play. Tonkin's recent projects have included several large-scale public art commissions. He is currently extending his research into virtual uh, reality, um, and his works are just absolutely fascinating. So we're very pleased to have you, John. Um, okay, so first I'd like to thank you, Alex, for in inviting me to be involved. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and to pay respects to any Indigenous or First Nation folk in the audience. So thinking about what to do today, I did talk to Alex about how I've had quite an interesting, as, as an artist who's beginning to work with virtual reality, it's been a really interesting time, the pandemic, in that I've seen way more work, um, virtual reality work, than I ever would have seen if there weren't, there weren't a pandemic. And that's because a whole lot of festivals have just had to move online. So first of all, two years ago, so so Alex mentioned that I did a talk as part of this, but I also put on a um, VR hub. And this was the first time Sylph had had a VR component. And it was, you know, relatively humble. There were six works, two of them, two Australian works, and then some other works, quite kind of well-known works that I thought were really interesting. Um, we had maybe 60 or 80 members of the public who went through. So then how do you run a VR festival during a pandemic? A VR headset is not a really ideal object to be sharing in a pandemic. And you know, pretty early on, I decided both with projects that I was working on myself that I was going to have to rethink things. And um, it's hard to know exactly how long that's going to last. Um, so these are the festivals that I actually um, I'm going to talk about. Well, I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about the festivals. I'm just going to talk about a few works and make it draw, draw a few threads between them. But um, Sundance was the first one. And it's interesting. I really developed my VR legs over the course of the year. The, early on, I found it fairly arduous. I'm not, I have multiple VR headsets because I'm interested in this, but I really i am not a gamer in any way. And I don't spend a lot of time in there. Um, but anyway, Sundance was the first one to go. And then um, Five Rs is a really interesting conference in a um, festival in Montreal, which is just dedicated to the R and AR works. And then more recently, Tribeca New Images, New Images Festival in Paris and Khan XR, um, also in France all went online and they all went into one program actually, which I think I have an image of later. So this was kind of Sundance's kind of warning. We're, we're doing things a bit differently in 2021. And they moved, you know, pretty much everything online. They did have some physical stuff, but, you know, I've, I'm also not particularly someone who hangs out in virtual spaces. I was never someone who embraced Second Life or any of those things. Um, but I did find myself in these spaces, but I felt pretty safe because when you're in Australia and you go to these spaces, they're empty. It's the wrong time of day. Occasionally I'd see people. So this is um, the space for Sundance and you would walk around these different screens and then you could enter the works through the screen. You had an avatar. Here's a couple of avatars at the festival bar. This is a similar kind of location for five arts. You can see they all kind of have a futuristic sci-fi kind of sensibility. XR3 is a really interesting program where 
the three festivals that are listed up the top there and that I mentioned before all kind of got together and agreed to show them simultaneously. Um, I did this through Steam, which is a you know, very common gaming platform, but I think you could also do it through Viveport. And you know, obviously to do this, you needed to have a reasonable VR headset, um, VR setup. But um, yeah, I'd be curious to know what their numbers were actually of, what, of how many people went to see it. So Museum of Other Realities is a museum that's existed for quite a few years online. And it has uh, permanent exhibits, but they also increasingly are hosting these sorts of festivals. And so for Khan, it seemed that they felt the need for a red carpet. There's the red carpet. There, you are, this is your sort of fairly disembodied avatar. And you can, you can see in this image, and actually in the next one I'll show you, there were these corridors down either side for the different festivals and off those corridors there were different rooms that you could enter and so you're doing this all in vr with your you're using your um controllers to kind of navigate around and occasionally occasionally i would see other people but more disturbingly i in one of these spaces i consistently would hear the sounds of other people but no it was kind of a little creepy um there's so you can see more down here so there were maybe 10 or 12 and within those um, spaces, they would build a kind of environment that reflected the work that was in there. You'd go in there, check out the environment, and then you'd somehow, there'd be a kind of portal type thing where you would enter the work. It was by no means a frictionless experience. And from stuff I've read, you know, quite a lot of people had issues getting it to work. So as uh, Alex mentioned, I did do a talk a couple of years ago and I just wanted to quickly touch on that in the sense because I want to kind of connect a couple of things together in this talk. So in that talk I really was looking at different modes of interactivity and I was looking at kind of more classic modes of interactivity where you're pointing and clicking. So these are a few of you know quite early works of mine where you were having to you were being asked to do things and you know I won't go into the works but you know that there was a series of you know, they generally had other kind of conceptual agendas underlying them. Um, this was another project which um, kind of ties in with the keynote this morning of kind of a, a celebration of, of data collection. And, but in this case, I was collecting my own personal data and then working out how that correlated with the rest of the world. Um, so I was contrasting works like that with works that I'd been doing more recently, where you were using your whole body to um, interact and there was a series of projects I did called experiments in proximity. And I was using kind of the notion of proximity as a metaphor for different models of perception. And so um, this image is of a installation where you, your um, proximity to the screen would affect what was happening. And as I think Alex mentioned, I've also worked on quite a few um, large scale public art projects that are also interactive. So more recently, I have become interested in VR, and I'm really interested in VR as, as, a, as a space that's kind of problematic. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in both the possibilities and the problematics, especially the problematics of the body. Um, you know, the body sometimes doesn't exist at all in, the, in VR, or as I was showing you in those other spaces, it can be a very minimal representation of an avatar. Um, I'm also interested in how meaning might be carried through physicality and, and bodily engagement. So I'm gonna go back a bit in time in, very, in various ways, but I wanted to start with Duchamp and Duchamp just in the sense of his notion that um, interactivity isn't a new thing. Audiences have always collaborated in the making of a work and audiences have always been active in terms of how they interpret and engage with the work. I'm going to now um, talk about a particular TED talk that happened in 2015. And I'm going to show you an excerpt of this actually. In fact, I hope this plays okay at each. I'm going to just change my share actually to, so let me do that here. Yeah. Optimize for video. So Chris Milk, okay. 
is an interesting artist, but he copped a lot of flack for this talk where he introduced the, the, the notion of virtual reality uh, empathy, empathy machines. And as a white man, I really enjoy making fun of other white men. <laughs> so as you might imagine, there's been quite a bit of criticism of this since, and it's complicated. I mean, if you look back at the history of media, there's always been a kind of techno utopianism, especially in the early days of those media. Like in the early days of film, people talked about cinema as being so much like thought itself that it, it was going to get into people's heads in a way and transform their thinking. Um, and you know, it, it, in many ways, film has changed people's thinking. Um, similarly, TV and so forth. But you know, there's also a lot of naivety happening there. Um, so Wendy H. Chung, H. K. Chung, um, wrote, "If you're walking in someone else's shoes, then you've stolen their shoes." which was a pretty nice um, response. Uh, Robert Yang, who's a really interesting um, queer artist slash, he makes um, really interesting games. Um, he wrote, he, he described them, empathy machines as being appropriation machines. But I, I mean, these are issues that documentary makers are all having to consider all the time. So I'm, I'm not saying in any way that it's black and white, but yeah, I'd have to say I really hate TED Talks and the notion of making a work to show a Davos is quite terrifying. You know, I'm going to show you now several works that, you know, where do they sit on this kind of, this line? Um, I'm not even going to tell you where I think they sit, but so this is a really interesting project, um, re-educated. And where, where possible, I've actually put links to, for information, but um, in many cases, a lot of these 360 video ones, you can actually see relatively easily now. Um, so th this work combines first hand first hand accounts of internment in Xinjiang, Xiaoxing, China. And it's um, combined with these hand drawn 360 animations, which are really stunning animations, but really quite disturbing, very claustrophobic and kind of the 360 aspect of it just adds to that because you, you are surrounded by it. Another work that I really enjoyed was um, Kinsha Shasa Now. And this is a really intriguing sort of documentary about a part of the world in the Congo where a whole lot of children, there's kind of like this hysteria of childhood exorcism and children are being um, taken to be exercised and if they don't agree to it, then they're rejected by their parents and they end up on the street. So this is kind of giving you that, that experience of these many thousands of student, um, children that are ending up on the street. This is kind of like a choose your own adventure. So at various points, your gaze, you can choose um, how to proceed with the story. And that obviously affects the outcome. The um, perhaps for me, in many ways, the most interesting of the festivals that I was looking at was the Five Hours Festival. It's a, it's a much smaller festival and it had a lot more unusual works. Like a lot of the, the big festivals are kind of trying to be like a mini, they're trying to position VR as being very much like film. Um, Five Hours had some really, so I really enjoyed this work. This was just 360 documentation, but it wasn't even, um, it was, it was a setup with actors, but it was a documentation of a real session of a particular type of therapy. It was like an hour. And I sat there through the whole thing and I actually found it, you know, he was taking them through different processes and I found it quite hypnotizing and uh, quite, quite mesmerizing. Another work that I really enjoyed in that and a, another um, more, in, more indie, less mainstream work was this one, Land of Milk and Honey. And this was, um, quite an abstract kind of work, but it, you could kind of get a sense of what was going on. The, the, you know, she writes about grappling with fertility loss and um, the physical, poetic and psychological complexities of the human body. So there were these different tableaus, which she'd filmed in different locations, but she'd use things like green screen in her backyard and to composite these different spaces together. And you know, that would blow over in the wind, or there was a certain point where you realize 
that it was filmed in a green screen tent and someone was dropping food and and from the top of the tent which was kind of like the hand of god coming down it was a really intriguing work uh, this is another work which is um very abstract and it's the kind of work that you would have seen a lot in computer animation festivals over the last 20 30 years but in some way somehow this work actually often i don't like these sort of works I, they feel a little empty to me but this work worked on such a oops, sorry such a kind of guttural affect visceral sort of way that i found myself actually quite terrified while i was watching it it was it, it played out as maybe a 10 minute work and it was just like quite a journey so the works that i've shown you all so far are all 360 videos so they're all they've all been shot with 360 cameras and um they're they're what's known as three degrees of freedom because really you have the ability to look around but you don't have the ability to move around and because i'm quite a nerd and i program work and i'm working on um building vr it's what you would call six degrees of freedom so that is more coded work where there's 3d models and you can actually navigate through them so in many ways i'm a little disparaging of 360 degree works but through the process of seeing all these it actually made put them back on my agenda and go and no, actually they are really interesting um so the, the next few work, the next couple of works i'm going to show you are more these um six degree of freedom um works where you can actually kind of walk around within them and, and look at things from different angles and and um, in the second one, I'll show you um, interact with objects. This one was just a really interesting, quite a banal kind of story of these two having a fight. But over the over the course of the fight, gravity just kind of stops working and things just start going totally awry. And it's just something really charming about it, about the way that it worked. And the last one that I want to talk about is the Book of Distance. And this was, I've, I've found this actually by far the most moving work. This was um, made by a Japanese Canadian, Randall Okita. And it's about his grandfather who um, left Hiroshima in 1935 and his experience of settling in Canada, his, in, his experience of internment and, and so forth. What he did in this, um, and this comes back to this idea of kind of more embodied modes of, modes of interaction was at quite regular points through the story. And you kind of move through a series of tableaus from the from in China, uh, sorry, Japan to packing bags in, in, in Japan. And you, you had to choose what objects to take. Um, when you were on the farm in Canada, at various points, you take photographs, which are kind of recreating real photographs. Um, there's quite a few different things that you do. And I've come across works like that before, which can feel quite forced, like I am uh, making me interact so that I feel connected to the story, but somehow this work did it really well. And I was really impressed. Um, so that's kind of a summary of just a smattering of my experiences. Like I, I've probably seen 30 or 40 works and if, you know, they seem to keep coming. I, I really hope that over the course of the next few years that these festivals don't stop doing this because like especially for as an artist living in australia i don't want to be spending thousands of dollars just to go see works um and you know let alone the in the i mean i hope that academia all around embraces a bit more of what we're doing here because i don't think it's particularly healthy for the planet for us to be jumping on planes left right and center i'm going to end it there um, hi, Ian and Deb. I'm glad you enjoyed the, the, the gig two years ago. Um, the, the therapy VR crossover I find really fascinating. Like I find, um, I find, oh, okay, sorry. I should not have both screens open. That is so confusing. <laughs> we're on a, we're, we live in a different world to the, those of you listening. We live at least 10 seconds ahead of you. Maybe we can let you know what's coming. Can I say something? Um, 
in response both to John and then to Katina. To John, what's so interesting to me is that VR in some way, I mean, I know you're, you may disagree with me completely, but when I put it, it's like VR needs the body to put on the machine to see the VR world. And, and without the body, um, in a way, at least what you're showing us, it's almost like an expanded visual documentary or a long scroll or, and, and I was very interested when you said 3% means you can look around but not move. And then you said 6% means you can move, you can move into the piece. But there was one on La Biennale with, with the, I guess, the, the African kids who were out on the street. And you said you could choose different things, but I, outcomes. But I thought, but did they really affect the real world outcome or were they just <laughs> game playing? So there's an, I mean, to be honest, when I put on a VR um, machine, I'm often very disappointed because, okay, you know, I can see something strange, but, it, but I'm in a body with a thing on my head. And the, there was one that worked for me, and I wish I could remember the name of the artist. It was at Museum of Modern Art, and it was an African artist who makes sculptures. And you put it on, and he created as if we were on the roof of the museum in his sculptures. And what was great about it was at one point, I thought my body was going to fall off. In other words, it, it actually gave me a a 360 degree of feeling, even though I'm sitting still, you are right, I was sitting still, but it was almost like, oh, I had to like almost take them off to make sure. It was something with a pink ball that when you focused on the pink ball, it would change the screen. It was very, the most complicated VR and the most interactive with spatial feeling. I mean, it seems to me the space is what's gonna be Important. But I just thought the irony that you need a body to put on the VR machine when it's all about virtuality. So I just thought there's something. But that's the interesting side in the middle, isn't it? That, um... Well, or, or just as Borgesian, you know, it's kind of like we're in the inside, but it's outside. I don't know. Although, um, you know, I feel like some VR works feel like they're a predecessor to um, entertainment for when we're all jars in brains. But yes. <laughs> I hope that's not the case. And, I, you know, I think I know. make work. So because I'm really interested in perception and I'm really interested in kind of the habits of perception and, and you know, think, but a lot of the work, this is, I'm, I'm just on the edge of making this work at the moment, but I want to kind of disrupt those habits of perception, but it's very hard to do that without making people just outright sick. So, you know, yeah, it's yeah, really right. straddling a line. But right. just going back to the comment about the, the, the therapy sort of aspect, um, I think that any really great artwork, no, not any, but many really interesting artworks work on a level of um, trance. And in fact, the, um, the great hypnotherapist Milton Erickson, he, he basically thought that we're all, every conversation that we have, we're hypnotizing each other, we're, we're putting each other in and out of trances, and that's kind of the basis of communication. So I think, you know, it's a fine line between overt, um, therapy and hanging out. <laughs> well, another artist who is a computer artist, I'll try to remember the name said, conversation is all about seduction. So it's kind of another sense of hypnosis trance. And then I just wanted to say to Katina, you said at one point about the, the person and the robot working together. And one of the things I found is, or the, you know, the, um, you know, the, the virtual and the person is, it was the women scientists who were most insistent on keeping the human in the picture. Uh, now I'm making a tremendous generalization and please don't attack me all you people out there, but it was like um, the male scientists were busy creating an ideal figure, often women, and the women scientists were either, you know, how can we keep the woman, the, the, the human in the picture. So in my film, there's a, a, a one who's working with medical and how, how people can learn to move medical devices or, or coming up with a, a robot that could go into spaces like when the miners were um, trapped in a mine, it could go into a space a human being couldn't go into. So I thought that was very interesting that gender was also determining um, 
uh, what would it be, the teleology, you know, the, the tele gender was changing what was going to result. So I just thought that was a point that you brought up. I think that's a magical point that you've emphasized. I think of the work of Kathleen Richardson of De Montfort University, where she has written books about the objectification of women through these sex bots, for example, this whole new industry that has been going now for quite some time, much more advanced uh, than some of the early prototypes that were made in Japan, for example, and had a different use value. Um, but this uh, area of research is burgeoning at the moment to understand what is going on. I mean, you mentioned why is Siri and Alexa a female voice by default? Uh, even my computer voice on Microsoft Word by default is a female voice. Why? And again, it's this objectification. The other thing that I've basically researched myself uh, through the artifact of the drone, for example, and the valences of the drone, uh, you know, is it toys for the boys? I remember holding a workshop at Ryerson University in Canada in 2013 uh, with Professor Avner Levin, where we actually discussed the spontaneity point that you raised earlier. Uh, it's on film and I can, sh I can share that with you. But, you know, we had a mixture of uh, people. It was actually Canada Day, it was a Sunday on that occasion. And people had come uh, and unbelievably, uh, when I said to people, we're moving to the other room, the men who had brought in the drones, picked them up and were caressing the drones and we're going to take them to the other room. It was like, you know, what's going on here? Unexpectedly, the MC, uh, Professor uh, Ramona Pringle, uh, an interactive media artist, a brilliant woman uh, who's done some amazing works herself, um, also observed the same thing. It wasn't just me. Um, and so I think you're right. Women build for necessity without generalizing, because there are so many women uh, yeah. in DARPA, in Facebook, for example, right. who, who are not doing this care and need response, but rather ideating, imaginating, you know, having this imagination, these dreams that men have, and building the artifacts that they dream, rather than asking someone, what do you need? It's this completely opposite paradoxical thing you know, ideate and tell me what we might want in our wildest dreams versus what does humanity need? And I'm worried we're ideating, as uh, a guest on my program said last week, for fake people that don't exist. We're building fake things for fake people. We haven't asked the people, what do you need? And I think in the same way, we have this imagination that AI will solve all our higher education woes. Who said, you know, give us the evidence. So I think you're right. And, and my film ends with the scientists saying we're developing these algorithms without looking at what the algorithms will evolve to. We, we have no order for it. We're just building and building. And um, there's also a whole section of sex robots in my film. So you there might you want go. to look at it. <laughs> Actually, go. it turns out somebody said in Toronto, there's um, a brothel of sex robots. And they tried to create one in Texas, but Texas said no. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then there was, an, I wanted to go film them, but I never got up there. But um, I don't know, this is just so weird. But, you know, there was a whole, the thing about brothels of robots is you need a whole servant class that clean the objects. Yes. <laughs> yes. I yes. Mean, it's Unintended consequences of our innovations, but really uh, quite sickly when we think about it, because if we're going to reduced acts, and this is just my personal perspective, uh, with machines, how much more are we denigrating the value of the function itself uh, or the action itself, whatever it is. So I, I think these kinds of things, I mean, we had a discussion that was open at this drones forum. These kinds of things ultimately lead to hate, you know, because if we're objectifying, and this is not making a judgment on individual person's uh, orientations or practices, it's much more about if we denigrate the human to this level because we create something and you know, other people argue, oh no, it will just remove the need for prostitution. It will remove this, it, you know, it will be the end of uh, modern uh, in, um, indentured sla uh, slavery and, and, and so forth. Actually, no, it'll propagate that rather it than will. diminish it. It's antibody. And I mean, that's where in all of this, it's like, what is a body? What do you need of a body? you know, what happens without a body? 
And that's why I asked in the VR is they affect the outcomes, but do they actually affect the outcomes? Or is it like, you know, playing Monopoly, you know, you're going down very interesting possible paths. Um, is, you know, she says, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, she had a question for you, Katina, but I think it can also be uh, broadened uh, to, to all. Um, could you elaborate more on the links between um, automation of higher uh, education and the increasing precarity and casualization of academia? So um, just those, so there's, you know, so I'll, I'll open up to everyone to sort of comment on both of those sorts of themes. Um, but yeah, yes. So the first question was about replacing actors with the sorts of uh, virtual sort of figures, you know, as a, as a service. And the second was about higher education. Sorry. <laughs> I think we can both, I think we can combine these two together. And yes, clearly we'll be replaced by um, 3D avatars. <laughs> can I disagree? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I mean, every time I see the latest Boston Dynamics videos, yes. it's, it could easily just be robots sitting, sitting here um, behind Zoom teaching the class. But if it's any consolation to you, the Boston Robotics was originally bought by DARPA. They were developing everything for DARPA. And then DARPA said, they're too noisy. They're gas motors. They're super noisy. So it's like having a little car in your ear. And DARPA said, this will not work for military. And then SoftBank from Japan took it over with a Japanese roboticist who was the most amazing with movement. Because actually in Boston Dynamics, what's crazy is moving like a human is is more frightening almost than looking like a human yeah. because there's something about the movement does seem real. Um, but now they couldn't sell anything. The only robot who's entered ha human habitats on a large scale are the sex robots. Everything else failed. Pepper was a little one for children in Japan with a with a uh, a chest of mechanical devices. It was it became weird. Um, and similarly, with a lot of these robots that they're trying to bring into people's lives, people go no. So um, I don't know what it means really, but it's, it's, we've got a way to go. I guess is really the issue. Yeah. But I love that you you expect us to be. Duplicated. <laughs> um, I'm sure your universities aren't any less um, looking for opportunities for optimization. We're going through a restructure as we speak. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and I guess uh, that brings in the notion of the uber human. Why just have uber taxis? Have uber humans. And uh, one of my students, when we were thinking about the future of innovation in a class called the future of innovation in the school for the future of innovation in society uh, came back and demonstrated what this uber human would look like and so you'd get an ipad put it on front of somebody's face you're at home and your face would beam into the classroom and you weren't physically there but the uber human was there for you so you wouldn't be forgotten around the round table back to the body uh abigail so you hired someone to turn up with your face plastered on an ipad wrapped around your head and sitting at a round table on behalf of someone who's at home misses the meeting, of course, but that's you. And so, you know, you need to take a restroom break at home. The uber human in the boardroom says, excuse me, I have to go to the restroom. Uh, but my students were, <laughs> were pretty amazing at showing me what's, what's, what is an uber human. So to Lizzie, I think metastage.com is fascinating. And we probably now on the serious side have Uber humans of slavery. And these are usually migrant yeah. workers. They're yeah. usually those who don't have rights, have been drawn through trafficking, through mules and supply chains that people don't want to talk about to countries to be made, but also sex workers against their will. They're given debts that they can't re repay and they're held hostage, uh, threatened either by missing limbs, as we alluded to in a VR experience and coming back with 20% and 30% insurance. Folks, we have millions of people who are living in this torturous state. And last I checked, the Human Rights Declaration, uh, Article 4, said we had ended slavery, but we've got something else called modern indentured slavery today. And so to the question on automation 
and what is happening to our academic sector, it is not just the taxi industry in New York uh, and the traditional taxis and medallions and licenses in Australia that have been taken away uh, based on the predatory practices of deregulation of Uber, Lyft and so forth. It is also our academic setting and it has meant the quantification of everything to the point that we've been denigrated just teachers if we're not producing a star journals and i'm going to say this because i'm no longer an academic in australia i have nothing to lose but we are quantified on research we are quantified on the journals we submit to we are quantified if we hit the screen and the down button starts to record at precisely the right time and don't leave five minutes early because the class has completed we're quantified and enslaved in fact most of us are strapped to our desks and our computers and the casualization bit is just about the temporary work don't you dare think you have a continuing appointment don't you dare think you have a job for life and even if you have one well we'll just find a way to fire you and chuck you out of the system and i speak like this because i've seen it happen to peers so at the end of the day if i want to have an ability to get rid of staff I hired, unanticipating that there would be a shortage in students, what you do is just say, you haven't made these benchmarks. Doesn't matter if you're the most brilliant person in our university, we'll find benchmarks that actually you don't squeeze into and we'll try and put a, a circle in a peg. Well, it doesn't work like that. And what's happening is we have what's called allostatic overload. We have humans, not uber humans, who are at the moment going through the worst crisis in their lifetime smart people, people who have dedicated their lives to mentoring students, thousands upon thousands of them. And we don't have people understanding that machines can't take their job, that they can't just automate these people, they can't casualize these people and hold them for ransom, because when they casualize them, they get rid of them. That's what's happened. People on fixed term appointments, people on part time appointments, people on RA temporary appointments, and we've got people working 18 to 20 hours a day, freaking out that they'll possibly lose their income and their mortgages. And sorry for this rant, but someone's got to say it in Australia, and I don't know what's happening in the rest of the world, uh, but someone's got to say it. This is wrong. We have to treat people as humans, and we have to respect them for the craft that they have given their lives to. And we can't produce PhDs that will walk down and say, I have no future. I, no matter what I do, I can write 10 monographs. I can do 10 installations. I can. I can get into 10 A star and I'm still not good, good enough. What new business model is going to work for this sector and we have to create it together? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to, you know, I guess the question is how can technology make these improvements that you're demanding and asking for very reasonably, not just for teachers and education, but in your earlier speaking of, of the kind of the serfs, the slavery, what's going on? I mean, how can technology serve these problems that exist in the world? It seems to me that that's where we need to put our minds on to some extent. Even though sometimes like in this whole pandemic time, the question is, what can I do? And sometimes we say among ourselves, well, you have to do what you're doing. You have to make your art. You have to believe in it. You have to go on. But but after what you just said, I, there is that question for me is how can technology actually make a positive difference? Big question. Yeah, um, and absolutely. And Katina, you know, um, I can see from for, for, for responses, it's really your 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 speech then really resonated, you know, with regards to to technology. And I I completely agree with you, Abigail, about um, you know for, for need to make technology work for people. Um, I'm a bit conscious of time, but I think we might just skip the the, the break. Uh, I just want to check: Does anyone have uh, any any last questions? But I I just you know um, but on, on that you mentioned how can we make technology work for people, uh, Abigail? And I was just wondering, um, because there's all these different types of ways of trying to, 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 to um, frame technology in terms of agency and so on. And, and you alluded to some ideas that I thought I, I would have loved to ask asked about object-oriented ontology and things like that. But I was wondering, oh, sorry. 
No, just yes. I mean, I hear you. I, I too am interested in that. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I was wondering, and this is kind of maybe for 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 panel. Um, how how do you think technology could um could improve the world? I uh, as it were, how could I mean? Obviously, technology already has in some regards, right? But how could it I I improve? Um, uh, you know, genuinely our empathy, our, our ability to relate to one another, uh, things like that, rather than simply becoming instruments of technology or instrumentalized like machines have been instrumentalized as it were you know um you know like i mean there's some utopian ideas like fully automated luxury consumer communism which is for most annoyingly long uh, title but the idea is that machines you know serve humans and so humans don't have to work so much right uh but you know of course in reality it seems to be more that it's a way of like making humans work more often technology you know it's used in that way so i'd be interested to hear your thoughts well, just a beginning thought, and, and I don't mean to be too goody goody, and I'm sure you know you could break holes in it, but in a way, Zoom over these two years, I have been at least the first year, I think we're a little exhausted now, but in the first year, there was a moment where I felt there were groups of people coming together. I was doing poetry walks and poetry tea, and we were talking to people in London and Montreal and, you know, like it became more global. And I literally met new people who were sharing my interests. And it was actually, it was enriching. It was a very exciting um, you know, we were writing every week, so it was actually pushing us in a way. So that was a very, you know, and I know Zoom has these other issues. It, it, it's such a metaphor for distance and space collapse, but it brought, it literally did that thing we've talked about where it brings people together that wouldn't have been in correspondence. So that's a simple little thing. It's not really empathy, but it's, it was exciting and it was, it was thought provoking for sure. And yet, on the other hand, we have the emergence of the alt right, Donald Trump, Reddit, et cetera, Absolutely. et cetera. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, these emergent, you know, nobody anticipated that. I think there was a lot of na naive techno utopian in the early days of the web. Right, exactly. Exactly. And I don't know how to, you know, how do you, well, how do you create empathy, but how do you, how do you reach? that humanist ideal for everyone it, it, it's not shared and that's something we've learned which has been very depressing actually but somebody else come up with something positive about technology so that we don't end on this complete negative note uh, <laughs> which is kind of funny I, because i mean i do find with teaching with zoom sometimes there's some types of classes it doesn't work for as katina uh, alluded to, but there are classes, as Katina also alluded to, where it works really well, you know, uh, like often I like to do a pre-recorded lecture for students watch it and they, you know, and, and with Zoom, because I often teach media related things, students can send me YouTube videos, whereas before that would have been very hard, it would have had much more anxiety around it. So for me, that's something really positive, but the university either wants to like almost ban Zoom or incorporate it full time at times, you know, when, when they see students complain about, about Zooms not being as good. Part of that's for usage of technology and how it's being used, I think. But yeah, so, so yes, so uh, mm -hmm. Katina, Katina, did you want to have any sort of final thoughts? Well, firstly, I love the thoughts that we're ending off on. I think they are positive. Um, back to AI and technology requires more humans. All of a sudden, the humble academic has to also know how to produce video, what angles, um, backgrounds, noise levels, um, content chunking, um, uh, resolutions, production, uploading. Friends, this takes a lot of time to do well. And I know a few people who do it end to end very well. So if we can demarcate roles, we have many roles to create. And I can guarantee you, we will reach with this same content, international communities. The other thing I want to move towards is an open business model. It's not even a business model. It's open democracy. It's open society, open data, open curriculums. Everyone should have a right to education. And I think that's what we're trying to do to ASU is lower those fees down where anyone can participate from anywhere in the world. But if we can use it in an open way, I think we're going to have great traction to educate people who would never have had an opportunity at education in education. Um, so beautiful points i'm very humbled to be in the presence of um john today and abigail i just 
wish they had the last word and I'm taking from them. Yeah. Well, if anyone has any final thoughts, but I thought that was beautifully phrased. Was okay, that was, that was a wonderful panel. I, I'm really grateful for, for all of you. We'll, we'll uh, reconvene in about uh, five minutes time and then I'll play a pre-recorded lecture from uh, Nina Power, and it touches on many of these sorts of issues. So in, in five minutes time, I'll be uh, playing that lecture.